Good evening, my name is Alexander Hagen. I'm the CEO of a small, medium-sized tech company in Silicon Valley. Previously, I was a financial analyst and a financial journalist. And I've also been a research engineer in telecommunications. <clears throat> I have a number of stories from the last month I want to cover tonight. So without ado, the facts that I cite in this report are not loosely researched opinions, but they are double and triple referenced indisputable facts. <clears throat> the comment section of this video provides links to credible, peer-reviewed sources. First, there is a struggle of libertarian right and the progressive left against a the theft from the people to the powerful. In this struggle, the libertarian right was greatly strengthened through the thrilling and inspiring oratory of Ron Paul. And unlike Obama, under that oratory there was an absolute conviction that we possessed that this man would do as he had said. All the evidence was there to support it through his 30 years in the political wilderness. People on the progressive left, like Glenn Greenwald and many others, saw this man was the only one willing to question the unbridled expansion of a military and correctional state that fed massive corporate profits, and not only profits, but expansion of these organizations to become major employers. Never mind that if we want to employ people, it could be in science or engineering or the arts or manufacturing. No, the great expansion in employment would be in the parasitic sectors of the economy, surveillance, militarism, police departments, that became more and more like paramilitaries. The wedding of large corporate structures with an ever-expanding state, the worst aspects of big government and big business, of the worst aspects of the left and the right. Last week, you lost the right to own a computer or a cell phone. So I'll just give you a tip on this one here. It's kind of amazing. <clears throat> Let's see if I can find it for you. Here we go. So you're not allowed to modify your property any longer, thanks to the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. It is not a possession anymore, but a service. If you misuse a product, you can be jailed. It is incredible. When I was in telecommunications research, we abstractly debated whether people wanted a refrigerator or the refrigeration service. Never did it occur to me that you could be jailed if you modified a refrigerator you bought. The copyright and patent laws now no longer reward innovation and invention. They suppress it. This is the tip of the iceberg. IBM, Google, Oracle, Apple have amassed millions of patents each. Your only recourse in many cases is small companies to hope to sell out to a well-connected large enterprise who can license license these many vague patents. Patents on your body, t cells, and tissues. Patents on things as trivial as one-click shopping by Amazon. And in each industry, consolidation occurs. As consolidation occurs, profits rise. Competition and choice dies out. Barriers to entry rise. And government grants, contracts, and licenses are given increasingly to these consolidated companies and their satellite subcontractors. So in the case of the telecommunications stimulus, I thought I was the only one to be infuriated that only the well-connected seemed to get it, which damaged small companies since I'm in uh, providing internet service. This was a threat to my company. <clears throat> but I found since then an excellent uh, documentary that you much, must watch called Orwell Rolls in His Grave, which details the problems of media concentration. Now, let us carry on. <clears throat> In the business of money itself, at the very top, lie the private equity firms. BlackRock, State Street, Fidelity, T. Rowe Price, and Vanguard. So I'll show you a little picture of this. So the curious thing about <clears throat> the uh, entire structure of ownership of the entire American economy uh, it really comes down to a small graph I will depict. Uh, let's see if I can find it for you. So let's start with the media. The media is owned by Walt Disney, which owns ABC, Sumner Rothstein, or Sumner, Sumner Redstone, who owns National Amusements, and by extension CBS, Viacom, and many theater chains, Comedy Central, VH1, MTV. Then comes Comcast, who has now acquired NBC, MSNBC, and it, is rather terrifying <clears throat> how little public uh, information has been provided in the media about this consolidation. So I'll be speaking about this more uh, shortly. Uh, so the companies that control these companies 
are these companies. Uh, let's see if I can get this for you. We have a Vanguard, 1.6 trillion assets under management. T. Rowe Price, 520 billion. Philadelphia, 1.5 trillion. Capital World Investors, 1 trillion. State Street, 1.8 trillion. And BlackRock, 3.345 trillion. So this is where all the money uh, gets funneled into and around. <clears throat> so these are the companies that control the world's money. Their funds invest in companies and comprise 60 or 70 percent of the equity in nearly every firm in the world. So I'll show you an example of this. Let's see if I can find it for you. So you can key in this yourself. If you look up here, I don't like the way Google does this, but I'll just copy this. Or, or uh, So this is the exact syntax you use. You put the format here. So if we look here, for example, at Boeing, who owns it? The top institutional holders. The total company value of Boeing is, oh, well, this is a, a different screen. Um, but we're looking at 10% of its owned by Evercore, so it's worth about $48 billion. And then down here, here are the mutual funds, Washington Mutual. This is a military industrial company. And then private owners, this guy here with 1 million shares, he's got about 73 million in it. But the private ownership is misleading because these people have vast influence because they're the founders and the managers of the companies. Boeing bought McDonnell Douglas. Mr. McDonnell is the number one private holder. <clears throat> okay. And the soup gets more and more tangled. So if we look at uh, in more detail, let's see if I can find this for you. So this is, shows the investor positions in the media uh, from about one uh, half a year ago. Um, so let's see. So we see Vanguard, State Street, and BlackRock together own 20, 30 percent of the media. And then Fidelity is here at 8.5 percent, T. Rowe Price, others. Um, and then Vanguard actually uh, is uh, is a number of different Vanguard funds for seven, ten percent. So Vanguard actually owns more than it looks like in this particular depiction. And then we have investments in um, war. Let's see if I've got something here. So this is Raytheon. Um, this is Boeing. This is Lockheed Martin. NOC, who is NOC? I've forgotten. Let's take a quick look here. And replace this ticker symbol with NOC. Northrop Grumman. So here, Capital World has 6% of the shares, which is worth $600,000. So that means that this company is only worth six billion dollars. <throat> Five large media companies have gathered almost all power to themselves in the media. So here, if we go back to media ownership, uh, we have Comcast and we have Time Warner, and then we have News Corp. <clears throat> Now, Comcast founders are Jewish. Some are Redstein, obviously Jewish. ABC uh, has known being uh, anti-Semitic traditionally, and they're known as being ultra-conservative. Um, I'll explain why this is significant shortly. Fox News, of course, ultra-conservative, if you want to call it that, or neo-conservative, I would prefer to say. And um, that pretty much covers it. So, <clears throat> CNN, Com uh, CNN, Comcast now owns NBC, Disney's ABC, Sumner, Ralph Strines, CBS Viacom, Rupert Murdoch's Fox News. Most people still think that Comcast is owned, uh, NBC is owned by General Electric. 
In General Electric, also an interesting thing is if you search their financial statements, you would be hard pressed to find their military industries. It is all classified under innocuous titles. Maybe General Electric, to avoid public scrutiny of the maker of the drones and bombs, Rachel Maddow covered in her story on Pakistan, Pakistan sold the enterprises uh, of the news outlets to avoid scrutiny. The joining of the powerful broadcast network of NBC with the primary cable company Comcast means that two competing in wa uh, lobbies in Washington become one. The rule in media and uh, in corporate concentration in industry seems to be 555 or 666. Six massive private equity firms controlling the investments of the unsuspecting labor unions, retirement funds, the average person, and the billionaire's stock portfolio. <clears throat> so in studying who owns uh, these large companies, State Street, uh, and so forth, um, you'll find they own uh, equity in each other. And the amount of assets uh, 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 in potential is absolutely astonishing. Um, it could amount to 50 or 100 trillion dollars that is uh, uh, guaranteed by these assets. <clears throat> and um, so the point being that the other structure to look at are the people, uh, fundamentally, who are the people who've got all the money? And so here we have a list of who's got all the money in this country. These top 100 guys at 20 billion a pop, that's $2 trillion they control personally. Uh, at the time of this snapshot, which is a couple of years ago. Um, and if we look at the Koch, the Charles Koch and David Koch are neoconservatives. Christy Walton, neoconservative. George Soros, a complex fellow who advocated for the invasion of Libya. Sheldon Adelson, uh, uh, vitriolic, uh, pro-racist um, policies of Israel. Um, the Waltons, ultra-conservative. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, complicated fellow. Jeff Bezos, Mark Zuckerberg, Sergey Brin. Hopefully some of these guys might be helpful. But uh, there are a lot of, um, uh, several of these guys are Jewish, and this is part of this uh, neoconservative and uh, pro-Israel, while Israel is damaging our national security through its uh, terrible leadership under Netanyahu uh, that causes problems for us. It's not Israel that causes problems for us. It's the right wing in Israel, which uh, triggers our war on terror complex. Um, the Mars family are ultra-conservative neoconservative, I should say, <clears throat> and we'll get into all of this uh, in more detail in a moment. So that's another part of trying to understand who owns this country, who owns our media, who owns our government, because wealth has been concentrating rapidly into the hands of fewer and fewer people. Our wealth inequality is rivaling a banana republic now. So five massive networks control the vast majority of television news and entertainment. Internet access is controlled by a very small group of players. The old Bell companies, the, old, the telephone company would split up and then they reconverged again. Verizon, AT&T, the two key players. And in cable, Comcast, the number one player, at least around here. There's also AOL Time Warner, which owns cable. AT&T and Verizon, if they bought uh, one of the broadcasts, then we would see this same vertical integration that we see with Comcast and NBC, which is very disturbing. Uh, I would be willing to bet that AT&T AT and, and Verizon might look at a company like CBS. I don't see how they would crack Disney, um, nor would they likely be able to buy Fox without a lot of controversy. Um, they might themselves get bought by Fox. Uh, one or the other stumbles. Though AOL, Time Warner, CNN is a possible target, and historically, of course, AOL, Time Warner is a con con uh, Time Warner is a content company. You tried to buy AOL to pro get the pipes. You combine the content and the pipes, and you have a near monopoly. So now we see some threats to the internet. It suits, and these threats are the walled garden phenomena. It suits companies like Showtime and ESPN to not allow access to their product via the internet. A great deal of content is locked up with the cable companies. If you don't have their cable TV product, you can't get their content online. I, for example, 
have Comcast, which I uh, wish I could cancel. Um, I haven't got my own service into my town on the coast side yet. Um, but I pay Comcast $10 a month to get Showtime so I can watch Oliver Stone's Untold History of the United States. And then I just turn it on on my computer and broadcast it on my um, monitor, my, uh, my projector. But I have to have Comcast in order to watch something on the internet. So people talk about net neutrality. There's some controversy because <clears throat> there's more than one way to slice it. And uh, so the libertarian says the more the government intervenes, the worse it gets. Uh, but I do uh, believe that we should have good regulation, just not corrupt regulation. So I prefer no rules over rules that benefit the powerful, but I prefer rules that regulate the powerful over no rules that are not corrupt. <clears throat> so this is called the walled garden, and these are ways of walling content off on the internet from providers other than a small number. And of course there are five or six major contractors in the national security state. Um, which are Raytheon, General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, and Northrop Grumman. And then there's this uh, uh, computer uh, company, SAI, uh, which makes the creepware for the police state. One in ten dollars of our economy goes to the military industrial complex, one in twelve to the prison industrial complex and police, one in five to medical insurance cartel. When you add that up just in and of itself, that's almost a third of our economy. 20%, 30%, 38% is more than a third of our economy. Clearly, real productive work is no longer really needed. <clears throat> now we simply need to drag blocks into the ocean, as Keynes described. Jobs are disconnected from real productivity. And now the news speaks, uh, and now the news speak is that we, instead of calling the wealthy and the rich, Wealthy and rich, we call them job creators. We could, and these jobs are disconnected from production of real wealth. So this is a sinister title because we don't need jobs. We need productivity. We need access to resources. We need to own the things that we need rather than selling our time to other people so that we can stay housed. The military is used to safeguard corporation, corporate manipulation of economies around the world. Commerce follows a flag, is a famous old saying. The military works for the big corporations in safeguarding their interests overseas and gives the big corporations trillions in pork lard and no bid contracts. The economy is becoming neatly divided into karetsus. Uh, these are uh, something like large cartels, and, or in Korean it's called chai bol. And yet there is hope. There is hope that there might be cause for some quiet optimism this month, but it will be a few minutes before I can cheer you. John Kerry is being nominated and has now been confirmed as Secretary of State. When he was questioned by Rand Paul, he made it clear he was a totalitarian. When he said that we, while agreeing that Congress should have the war power, he said, but sometimes in an emergency, the president needs to act, which contradicts that statement. He claimed our acting in Benghazi would save 10,000 lives. Incredibly and disappointingly, Rand Paul did not pursue this line of questioning. In fact, at most a few hundred would have died in putting down the Benghazi revolt. And the people the CIA infor informed Obama, Clinton, Kerry, and the, so forth, they all damn well knew that. The Gaddafi government, had it, had it been treated with respect rather than like dirt, would likely have accelerated the pace of reforms as Libya had been liberalizing uh, for the last uh, nine years since they essentially surrendered their weapons to the Bush administration, began cooperating with the West and doing its bidding to some extent. Kerry used this same lie to justify using Libya for NATO target practice as we had used in Iraq and in the decision to nuke Japan, a hypothetical massacre. In Vietnam, we attacked our own ships in the Gulf of Tonkin. The propagandist lie that accompanies every war of choice should be attacked frontally, 
never submitted to and always exposed. We could go through the wars of the last 100 or 200 years, and each one was preceded with a propagandist reason, a distortion, and most of them, in their times as well, went unchallenged until the war started. The questions only start coming out after the deed is done. Not ready to admit that no consideration was given at all for Libyans by killing instead of thinking. Thoughtful solutions are complicated, do not play well on TV, and involve potentially embarrassment from setbacks and can take time. Now 10,000 surface-to-air missiles and hundreds of thousands of small arms are spread like a plague out of Libya into Syria, transshipped to Turkey, and throughout the Sahel, that region of Africa, between the Maghreb on the coast of the Mediterranean and uh, uh, Central Africa, which is basically the Saharan countries. The two greatest treasures in Africa are now destroyed. <clears throat> in the New York Times, and I'll get to what those are in a moment, in the New York Times in December, the Obama administration apologetically and brazenly described their criminal conspiracy to David Kirkpatrick and nearly a dozen other journalists, that the U.S. gave the green light to Qatar to Qatar, I should say. The reactionary religious fundamentalists rule Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Bahrain hated Gaddafi because he publicly exposed them for what they were. And if you like, you can Google ten, Gaddafi's 10 insults to the world, and you'll see him uh, speaking to the Arab League and making fun of everyone. Um, and they deserved it. <clears throat> he may or may not have been a very nice man. In fact, his portrait is complex, a Bedouin who received a master's degree in history, uh, who became uh, the head of a young officer's corps, who created a bloodless coup that opposed a monarchy installed by the British after World War II, and, who, and did really nothing for Libyans, this monarchy. A Nasserite, an idealist, and perhaps a bit mad, as many brilliant people seem to be and perhaps are. Our journalists were briefed by the White House on how the U.S. gave the green light to Qatar to ship weapons to Libya, to the only group who knew how to use them, a conservative religious extremist organization that had staged a bloody insurgency in Libya at the same time the Algerians were battling uh, ex ex extremist religious conservatives uh, uh, insurgency in the 80s and 90s. <clears throat> the insurgency in Algeria was horrendous. Whole villages were massacred. There isn't a single family who didn't lose a member practically in Algeria. And these were the people that we armed and trained. People who were quite at home with the Salafist Wahhabi philosophy of Osama bin Laden and the House of Saud and the Emir of Qatar. Qatar. Our best friends when they control oil and do our bidding. Our worst enemies when they don't. This group was the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. And Abdul Hakim al Belhaj, one of its leaders, became the military commander of Trip Libya's trip capital Tripoli after the Qatari and other national special f nation special forces stormed the Gaddafi compound. It was pretended that it was the rebels who stormed the compound, but it was actually special forces from other countries who were the vanguard of storming the compound. The Obama administration told the Qataris to ship weapons to Libya as long as they couldn't be traced back to the U.S. This is certainly a felony criminal conspiracy to commit mass murder. It is calmly laid out in the New York Times as an explanation of how jihadists took over the Libyan uprising. It was the families of the jihadists who started the uprising. How could this have surprised anyone? Yet the Obama administration did not enter this into their calculus, apparently. When people allow bombing to start, when people liquidate the armed forces of a nation, plunging the northern half of a continent, Africa, into instability and chaos, evil and incompetence can be hard to distinguish. Harry Truman and George W. Bush both exhibit these problems. Were they evil, unleashing atomic weapons on Japan with the entire war concluded and Japan isolated? Or was it a fundamental incapacity to think properly? This is what Nelson Mandela said of George Bush. He said, the man cannot think properly. Who unleashed the bankrupting of the healthy part of the U.S. economy and the enriching of the parasitic crony capitalist part with his war of terror, as Borat said? So does that mean that Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama are also intellectual mediocrities? So in addition to the fact that four cities were wholly or partially razed to the ground in Libya due to our so-called humanitarian intervention, and that rape on a wide scale has been conducted not by Gaddafi forces, but against women suspected of having been arrogant under the socialist uh, government of uh, Gaddafi, the Jamaharia, which at least publicly 
advocated and had on its law books, equal suffrage uh, for uh, minorities uh, and uh, equal rights to religious and racial minorities and women. All these minorities are under attack now. The Sufis, blacks, women. The government is virtually devoid of women. Libyans who are unhappy with what has taken place are threatened, tortured, and killed on scales hundreds of times larger than under Gaddafi. Around 50 to 100 cases were filed a year at most through Amnesty International of Libyans disappearing, mistreatment, or execution for political reasons. Blacks are lynched, Sufi shrines are torched, rare manuscripts burned, and the Emir of Qatar and the House of Saud press for even harsher treatment of their vassals in Libya today, for it is the Qataris who largely call the shots. Now the greatest, most tri priceless treasure in Africa has been destroyed in Mali. Thousands of manuscripts and books written over a period of 800 years, torched by the religious fundamentalists we armed and trade in Libya as they spilled over the borders into uh, Mali. So in Mali we have a situation in, in a simple form of four or five factors. Uh, there was a so-called elected government there that fell due to a military coup recently. There are internationalist forces in the north. Uh, many of them have been injected uh, or are coming armed from Libya. And then there are the Tuaregs who want their own nation in the Sahara, which threatens the other nations. And the Tuaregs were defeated by the, I don't like to use the word Al-Qaeda, but for the moment we'll call it the Al-Qaeda sorts of groups. They were uh, the Tuaregs who had been staging a war for independence in northern Mali were militarily defeated because they had machine guns. The people who came out of Libya had rocket launchers. Um, the jihadists uh, looted all of the weapon depots as we completely annihilated Gaddafi's entire security forces, his military and police from the air with each NATO country testing their weapon systems, uh, developing valuable information to improve their military by killing people in Libya. One day Norway would take a turn, the next day Denmark, the next day France. It was truly shocking and all the time in the media articles are being printed about how great this was going to be as a showcase for various types of armaments sales. France sends its forces into Mali to contain the fallout of its bombardment of Libya and reassert their military might and imperialist dreams, and to do some good as well, as things are not black and white on either side of the equation. But it was too late for the intellectual heritage of Africa, apparently. <clears throat> and to give you an idea of how uh, much information we had uh, that disputed the official narrative about Libya, this is an article that I have and I will post in the comments uh, that goes over the vast number of problems with the official narrative about Libya. And this was a basically Libya blowback report I wrote. And this was before Chris Stevens. This is before the media went into this huge frenzy about Libya, which had nothing to do with the real crimes that occurred in Libya. Chris Stevens was one man. We're talking about millions of people being affected. So you see, all of this blowback was before any of the official blowback. The official blowback, of course, has been the uh, Algeria uh, hostage-taking, because one white death screams louder than 10,000 African deaths, and Chris Stevens' murder, because one white death screams louder than 10,000 African deaths. Previously, there was another, the second greatest treasure in all of Africa also was destroyed as a result of America's uh, leading from behind in Libya, which is, there was a vast room in Benghazi filled to the brim with gold and silver t coins in the time of Alexander the Great, about 300 BC, each coin worth as much as $250,000. These are all disappeared now from the museum in Libya at Benghazi. The treasure would certainly exceed $1 billion and is in fact priceless. History is under attack in Africa, and I place the blame on Obama, on Samantha Powers, Susan Rice, Hillary Clinton. Also, it's very interesting to read about Susan Rice, what a privileged young lady she was, and what a conservative father she had. Uh, you would think because she's partly African-American, she's sort of some sort of rags to riches stories. 
story, but not at all. And I, gr I grilled her mercilessly, knowing nothing about her background, just looking at her actions, her disinformation, and her bloodthirsty manner. And I was absolutely spot on once people started doing an expose on her background, once the press went into a frenzy over the killing of three Americans in Libya, having ignored the deaths of 30,000 Africans. I place the blame on Obama, Samantha Powers, Hillary Clinton, the CIA, the Pentagon, Sarkozy, Cameron, uh, Berlusconi, and all of them. The one who should be put through the Nuremberg trial, the treatment the most from start to finish is Anders Fogh Rasmussen, who is a uh, general, uh, commanding general of NATO, secretary general of NATO, I believe. There is no fate horrible enough to pay for his actions and crimes and his remarks. We shall continue our operation in Libya until no civilian can be harmed. These legally statements could be used to justify the murder of the entire human race. So Libya, once one of the most peaceful and educated countries in the world of its class and size, is now an anarchic place run by local warlords who jockey for spoils and power. Some there may think the price is worth it to rid themselves of Gaddafi, but it all could have been avoided by some intelligence in our State Department to rein in the shoot first, ask questions later, uh, militarists, and media propaganda spin doctors feeding a massive pack of lies for her and Obama and Rice to regurgitate constantly. I've dissected all of this previously. If you go to my website, I've done about a hundred videos trying to uh, slow or stop the slaughter in Libya. America did not intervene in Egypt or Tunisia, and perhaps one or two thousand protesters and police have died in the chaos in these countries. In Libya, with a very small population of only five to six million, hundreds of thousands have become homeless, tens of thousands raped and beaten, tortured, or gunned down in the streets in reprisal killings, and tens of thousands have lost their lives. The same is the recipe for Syria where the U.S. gave the same logistical aid leading from behind, militarizing a political problem, leading to immeasurable suffering. If all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. That is the lesson of the U.S. NATO military juggernaut bungling and eager to test its systems and power every time a crisis erupts. Countries with peaceful revolutions usually do well. Countries with violent revolutions usually do not.